Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about a very difficult subject. A subject that you might have strong opinions on and that you might think is a settled thing if you take the word of some recent prominent biologists that have come out and made sweeping statements on this topic. The topic of course is, is biological sex a simple binary? To begin, I want to show you a pair of karyotypes. Karyotypes are smears of chromosomes, um, and from these smears of chromosomes, we can determine whether individuals are males or females. So on the A panel, you can see you have the 22 pair of autosomes, and then you have a pair of sex chromosomes. You see the same thing in the B panel. Now in humans, we know that males are typically XY, and females are typically XX. So in panel A, if you go down here to the sex chromosomes, you can see there is one X and there is the diminutive Y. This individual, using a karyotypic understanding of sex, would be male. You would define them as male. Um, in the B panel, you can see this individual has XX and no Y. Therefore, you would classify this individual as female. This is important to understand and to kind of begin because there's been a lot of uh, political pressure in redefining sex as something as determined by your chromosomes. This is a couple of things that are important for us to understand. And one is that politicians are listening to biologists. Politicians don't know anything about chromosomes. They don't know anything about genetics. They don't know anything about biology. And so when a biologist says males are XY, females are XX, they can latch on to that and they can say this is how we are going to, to define biological sex. It appears to be binary, XX, XY. We can use that definition and we can group people into males or females. This has entered into legislation where politicians have tried to prevent people from doing one thing or another based on their chromosomes. However, this, these two panels that I'm showing you, the A and the B, aren't from different individuals. They're from the same person. This is the clinical report that discovered this karyotype in this person. The title is High Level of 46XX, 46XY Chimericism Without Clinical Effect in a Healthy Multiparous Female. This is a woman that has had multiple children and has no obvious phenotypic effect. There seems to be nothing wrong with her at all. She's had, again, she's had multiple children and yet her karyotype is mixed. That means in some of her cells, she is XX. In other cells, she is XY. Under the sort of political definition here, this individual could not be classified because she does not fit into a simple binary. This leads me to this very recent interview that prominent biologist Richard Dawkins gave to Pierce Morgan on Fox News. Fox News is not a place that is known for its nuance. It's not a place that's known for careful consideration of both the biology and the social impact of the conversation that's being had. This is something that Richard Dawkins, Oxford educated Richard Dawkins, should be very aware of. And yet he came to this interview and said, as a biologist, there are two sexes. He dismissed any nuance that could exist in this conversation. He then openly defended J.K. Rowling, who has made a series of transphobic comments. Jerry Coyne, another famous biologist, also rose to the defense of Dawkins, saying effectively the exact same thing, that as a biologist, sex is binary. Michael Shermer, who is not a biologist, but who is respected among certain communities and is sort of like the, I don't know, editor of Skeptics Magazine, also supported Dawkins. He retweeted this interview and he said he's obviously right. Uh, 
sex is defined by gametes. Females make eggs, males sperm. Dawkins' argument here is that biologists understand sex by gametes. Uh, again, that females make eggs, males make sperm. As I just showed you, there was a, the sex definition we had used previously was based on chromosomes, but Dawkins is suggesting that biologists use gametes to define sex. So let's talk a little bit about this concept of gametic sex. So there are multiple types of gametes across living organisms. In some organisms, there is what we call isogamy. That is where there is no differentiation of gametes. You can't tell them apart morphologically. And so what we tend to do is assign them plus or minus uh, because you can't actually tell them apart. So we don't call these individuals males or females. And also because there can be multiple different mating types that are mutually incompatible with each other. And so it makes no sense to call things males and females in an isogamous environment. For most animals, you actually have a nisogamy. This is where there is differentiation of the gametes and you can actually tell them apart. When you can actually tell the gametes apart, then we begin to label them as male or female. For most vertebrates, oogamy is predominant in which female gametes are large and motile and male gametes are small and motile, i.e sperm and egg. Now this is the definition based solely on gametes and it's important to remember here what we're sexing are gametes. Let's dive into that in a little bit more detail. So let's take a second and think about what exactly is being sexed. Dawkins and Coyne suggest that biological sex is determined solely by gametes. But an individual is not just their gametes. An individual is composed of many other cells as well. And these cells and the, the cell types that an individual is composed of is generated by a complex interaction between their genome, the, the genetic mechanisms, and environmental mechanisms. And we're including in that also developmental processes. These things all interact with one another and they can lead to differences across individuals in what sorts of cells are, are generated as well as the way in which specific organ systems that are going to generate gametes are generated. So let's kind of break the individual up in a sort of simplistic cartoon. And that's what I've done here. So the individual is the composition of all of these things, including the genetic, the gonads, and the genitalia, as well as the gamete. That is the individual. Now an individual may have a very, very clear biological sex. That is to say that the individual has all the cell types that are recognized by males. They have the genetic architecture of males. They have the gonadal architecture of males, the genitalia of males, and they produce male gametes. That is to say they produce sperm. Uh, in this sense that this is an unambiguous male. Everything follows suit and you could take the gamete and, and use it as a proxy for identifying the sex of the individual. I want to make clear that gametes are virtually never used in sexing individuals. While we can kind of simplistically say that males produce sperm and females produce eggs, when we're actually out in nature sexing organisms, we don't look at their sperm and eggs. We, we almost never rely on sperm and eggs when we're sexing individuals. We generally look at genitalia or we can look at gonads for organisms that are that are transparent, that you can actually see through their body wall, or we may use chromosomal architecture. Uh, very rarely do we look at gametes, and in humans, we never do this. Humans are overwhelmingly sexed, not by their gametes, because at birth you're not producing any gametes, you're being sexed by your external genitalia. Um, even if we were to sex by gametes alone, remembering, of course, that we wouldn't be able to sex humans until puberty, so we obviously don't sex this way, but let's assume we did, some individuals produce both gametes or they produce no gametes. In those cases, we rely on secondary characteristics to sex them, especially in the case in which no gametes are produced. So if sex is solely determined by whether you produce sperm or egg, individuals that don't produce sperm or egg are then just sexless. That's obviously not the case. If you don't produce sperm or egg, you can just look at a different characteristic to try to sex that individual. 
Perhaps you would look at their genitalia, you would look at their gonads, you would look at their chromosomal structure, or you could even look at some other secondary sex characteristic like hormones. Do you have facial hair? What does your musculature look like? What does your skeletal structure look like? There's like other ways in which you would attempt to sex this individual. Again, remembering we don't sex individuals by their gametes anyway. Um, and importantly, these secondary characteristics that we would then rely on in the case of individuals producing no gametes or producing both gametes can be ambiguous with gradations of intersexuality. And because of this, because this, this gradation of intersexuality exists in these secondary characteristics, it means that biological sex cannot be considered as a simple binary. And I want to give you a few cartoonish examples of this, in which at each case, I want you to think about how you would define this individual. Are they male or are they female? Can you fit them into a simple binary or would you say that they were intersex? So let's start off on the far left. The far left is the clearest case. This individual has the male chromosomal configuration XY. They generate male gonads. This is what we showed here in red. And those male gonads have male genitalia that produce male gametes. This individual is very easy to sex. At every step of the way, they clearly produce the male phenotype. They clearly produce the male gametes. There is also this case in which the chromosomal structure can be ambiguous. It can be XY or it can be XXY. They can have a pair of gonadal systems, both males that have fully functioning testes, but also can have a uterus and fallopian tubes, but they produce only male gametes. So the gamete you might could classify as male. Clearly that gamete is male. But would you say that that individual is male? Are they obviously male? Are they unambiguously male? What if we get a little bit more complicated? The case in which an individual produces both gametes, sperm and egg, they have both reproductive systems, and they have an ambiguous karyotype. Again, their gametes you can classify as very clearly female and male because gametes are binary, but is that individual male or female? Are they both? What does that mean? Male plus female? How do, you, how do you then describe that individual? Or is that individual a binary? Or is that individual intersex? That is to say, they, they contain both sexual characteristics. If that's the case, then they are neither male nor female. They are both. They are intersex. Again, the gametes are binary. The gametes are female and the gametes are male, but they are coming from a single individual. And we don't sex gametes, we're sexing individuals, right? This is the important thing here. How do we assign the sex of that individual if they produce both gametes? Then we get into the case in which individuals produce no gametes at all. So you could have a phenotypic male that may have variations in chromosome structure, but a phenotypic male that has male gonads, male genitalia, but produces no gametes. And this way, we very obviously can't rely just on gametes to sex this individual. We have to look at other sex characteristics. Now, if we go with their genitalia, if we go with their reproductive set, their, their gonads, their chromosome structures, we might would say this individual is biologically male, despite the fact they produce no male gametes. Additionally, you can have an individual that has the male gonadal system and the female gonadal system, they can have male genitalia or female genitalia, variations in chromosome structure, and produce no gametes at all. What would you call this individual? In this individual, they have a very obvious external genitalia that's either male or female, but they have an ambiguous internal system that includes both male and female and potentially an ambiguous chromosome structure. Is this individual male? We don't have the gametes to go by, so we, we can't use the simple dichotomy of the gametes, and they have both gonadal systems. In this case, what are they? Are they the same thing as in the intersex individual that produced the gametes? There's no gametes, so there's no clear binary here. How would we define this individual? Are they not also an intersexed individual? 
Lastly, you can have the most ambiguous case where the internal anatomy is ambiguous, in which case individuals could have ovotestes, which display both ovarian and testicular tissue types. They produce no gametes and they can have an ambiguous genital structure and they can have variations of chromosome structure. What about this individual? There is no clear differentiation in the gonadal system. There's no clear differentiation in the genitalia. They produce no gametes and their chromosome structure displays a range of different genotypes. How do we define this individual? Are they a simple binary, male or female? Once again, we don't have the gametes to rely upon. Now, this is just a simple cartoon. However, I want to make clear that the every single one of these instances have been documented. The, there are people that have each and every one of these instances, and I want to just sort of show you that whole range, going from the very typical male at one end to the typical female at the other end, and every one of the variations in between. The variations are even finer than what I showed in this previous cartoon, but I just want to give you that I didn't just make up each one of those different instances. There are actual conditions that display those instances. Again, if at any point you were unsure about how you would sex that individual, or if you think intersex is the better way to describe that individual, or if perhaps there's some gradation of sex where they display some male, some female, then it becomes very obvious that biological sex is not a simple binary, that biological sex doesn't merely rely on the gametes, that we're talking about something more. We're not sexing gametes, we're sexing individuals, and individuals produce gametes or they don't produce gametes. They produce both gametes or they produce only one gamete. They can produce one gamete, but have the production structures of both. There is a range of variation. And to try to fit all individuals into very simple, neat categories based solely on gametes will fail. You will not be able to differentiate individuals that either don't produce gametes or that produce both gametes. Again, we're sexing the individual. We're not sexing gametes. This is where Dawkins and Coyne and Shermer and many others appear to really misunderstand what the conversation is about. We're not talking about gametes. And gametes alone will not allow you to sex individuals. Furthermore, again, the sex that you're defined, the sex that you're given at birth is not defined by your gametes. You don't produce gametes at birth. Your sex is determined by your external genitalia. Why does this matter? Why is it so important to rebuke Dawkins on this, to rebuke Jerry Coyne on this? Because the way in which we define sex has a major impact on both human health and politics. Remember, Dawkins is not talking to biologists. He's on Fox News. He's talking to a political pundit, a political pundit that thinks that sex is binary and is looking for a biologist to agree with him. Now, remember, the audience of Pierce Morgan don't know anything about biology. They don't know anything about sperm or egg. All they know is the secondary sex characteristics. And what they, in their mind, what they see when Dawkins says something like, there are only males and females that sex is binary is they they then convert that in their heads to meaning that trans people don't exist that that trans people are there's just something wrong with them they're actually just males pretending to be females or females pretending to be males that's the way they interpret that and for him to not understand that to just flippantly state that there are only two sexes when, again, the people that work in sex development, and I'm going to talk about them in just a moment, disagree with that is irresponsible. So let's talk about socially, politically, and for human health, why it matters that we get this right and that we inject some nuance into this conversation. So first, politicians seek to exclude trans people and those with developmental sexual disorders from public spaces by using various definitions of sex. 
they either use a chromosomal definition or whatever sex you're, you're given at birth or hormonal levels in the case I'm fixing to talk about. They're always trying to find a way to exclude people from social activities. So I want to talk about the track star Castor Semenya. Um, she has had a very public case in which she has been excluded from participating in several races because she is an intersex individual. She was assigned female at birth. However, as she got older, she began to produce a large amount of testosterone because she has an XY chromosome structure and possesses internal testes. So upon puberty, she began to produce a lot of testosterone. Now this has led to many agencies, many sports agencies, to suggest that she produces too much testosterone and therefore should not be allowed to compete in these races. She has, of course, fought back against this, claiming that she is a woman. Um, she was raised as a woman. She identifies as a woman. She was assigned at birth as a woman. And so to be excluded from racing with women is insulting to her. And so, of course, she took these agencies to court and she was represented by Dr. Eric Villain. And I want to read what Eric Villain stated in this on this topic. He said, quote, people think that it's simple to define sex. It's not says Dr. Eric Villain, a geneticist who specializes in the study of sexual development in Children's National Health System and George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Dr. Villain, who testified as an expert witness on Castor Semenya's behalf, explains that the biology of sex classification is anything but straightforward. There can be a wide spectrum of variations. Quote, it's really difficult to support a rule that seems to be based more on a preconceived idea of what, of what a woman should be rather than who a woman is. This is an individual, Dr. Villain, who leads the Children's National Health System. He is a clinical geneticist. He is a specialist in developmental sex disorders. Let's juxtapose his experience with someone like Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is a behavioral ecologist whose contributions to science have been based in the evolution of animal behavior applying evolutionary game theory. The reason I juxtapose these two is because a lot of the supporters of Dawkins like to point out that Dawkins is this famous, brilliant biologist. What biologists like myself recognize is that all of us have different areas of expertise. I am not an expert in development. I am not an expert in paleontology. Those aren't my fields. I would never go on to a news show like Fox News and profess to know to be an expert in paleontology. It would be absurd. I'm a population geneticist. If I was gonna go on to Fox News to talk about population genetics, fine. If I was brought on to talk about se human sexual development, I would say, there is nuance and that this is what the experts say. I would not profess, I am a biologist, I speak for biology, I am a master biologist, and what I say is what everybody thinks, despite the fact that people like Dr. Villain here would vehemently disagree with his characterization. Again, this is a person who is a clinical geneticist. He heads the Children's National Health System and specializes in developmental sexual disorders. If I were to go to a biologist and say, which one of you could speak to the nuance of this topic? I wouldn't go to Richard Dawkins. I wouldn't go to Jerry Coyne, who is a fruit fly geneticist. I would go to Eric Villain. I would go to the developmental biologist that actually worked in human development, the clinical geneticist that understand developmental sex disorders. So please keep that in mind. Whenever you see these famous biologists go on television, especially if they're on like a political pundit show like Pierce Morgan, please like look up, look into them understand that they have an area of expertise and that when they make these broad sweeping statements they are probably talking outside of their area of expertise those of us that still work in the field which i should point out dawkins hasn't in a very long time those of us that are still involved in research don't do that we recognize when something is outside of our field so why does this matter one clear way that it matters is that politicians try to exclude intersex people they try, to ex they try to pretend that intersex people don't exist. 
because there's male and female. That's what Dawkins said. And Dawkins is an expert. Dawkins is the biologist that speaks for all biologists. So if he says there's only two sexes, well, I guess Castor Semenya just doesn't exist. Another way in which this is very important is that people with developmental sex disorders are often forced into one sex or the other at birth, often arbitrarily in an attempt to, to conform to the supposed sex binary. I want to give a specific example of, of this individual who has spoken openly about his condition, and so I feel comfortable kind of sharing his story because he, he has blogged on this, he has made videos on this and given interviews on this, and so I would like to just kind of share his story here. So Antoine was born in a small town in Ural, Russia. He was assigned female at birth based on the appearance of his genitals, but when, thir when at 13 years old, he went through puberty according to the male pattern. He showed male secondary characteristics, his voice broke, he developed facial hair, and did not start menstruating. Because of his religious family, in 2010, he was sent to a monastery as family members believed that, quote, demons were sitting in him. He has stated that he was advised to pray in order to be cured and become a normal woman. When he was 15 years old, he was sent to the hospital due to intense stomach pains. The priest suspected that it was a result of not menstruating for a long time. However, the hospital found that he did not have a uterus and consequently could not have periods. Antoine has ovotestes. This is a condition in which you, you develop both testicular and ovarian tissue into a single organ and a single structure that we call an ovotestes. So biologically, Anton is an intersex individual because his religious family didn't understand that intersexuality was a thing that existed because they believed, as Dawkins just irresponsibly went on Fox News to say, sex is binary. There are male and there are female. If you don't fit into either one of these, you must have a demon in you. Or we must like literally give you to give an infant surgery to make them conform to one thing or another. Both of these things have long lasting psychological impacts on people. Intersex individuals exist and their existence is not just a mistake. Uh, I'm, I'm showing you down here a tweet that was sent to me after I commented on Dawkins's tirade, on Dawkins's opinion. Um, and they said this. The fact that sometimes Mercedes and BMWs get irrevocably entangled in an accident does not mean car models are a spectrum. Intersex individuals are not car wrecks. They're human beings. We need to understand something very simple. Every single human being has novel variation genetic and phenotypic variation that did not exist in the, in the preceding generations. Some of that variation harms your fitness, makes you less likely to have children. The entire human population harbors a proportion of deleterious variation. Are you just a car wreck because you harbor deleterious variation? Are you a car wreck because you are different than what your parents were? Everyone is unique. Human genetic variation, which is expressed in human phenotypic variation, is natural. Individuals aren't car accidents. By merely acknowledging the complexity of biological sex, we recognize that these people are part of the existing human variation as opposed to being just mutants or car wrecks. Folks, if you take nothing else away from this, please recognize we all are different. Every one of us are different. Some of us differ from the normal phenotype very slightly. Some of us differ much larger. And we differ in various different ways. Some of us may differ in digestive systems. Some of us may differ in reproductive systems. We all display variation. Some of that variation helps us. Some of it harms us. Some of it doesn't do anything. Variation exists. And folks, Dawkins knows this. He knows this. Remember, he's on Fox News. He's talking to a political pundit. If he is so naive that he doesn't recognize that in stating that biological sex is a simple binary, he's, he, he's, he's just being deliberately obtuse.
He's stating it to a political pundit who wants to enact the things that we just talked about, who would want to exclude Castor Semenya from being able to compete, who would, who would consider Anton a freak. Humans aren't car wrecks. In summary, I think it's very important that we, we kind of come back to Dawkins and Coyne's initial claim, that we can sex individuals by their gametes. Remember, folks, that's not how we sex individuals, that a gamete can have a sex, but an individual may match that gamete sex, may have another sex, they may be both male and female, they may produce both gametes, they may produce no gametes, they may have ambiguous gonads, they may have ambiguous genitalia, they may have ambiguous chromosomal structures, all of these things matter, and it doesn't matter how rare it is. This is a, another absolutely preposterous thing. I, it doesn't matter to me if one in seven billion people display this trait. It only takes one person to show this trait, to show that it's not a binary trait. This is not difficult. And it's just completely irresponsible. Both as a biologist, it's irresponsible. And as a member of society, it's irresponsible. And like that you don't recognize the audience you're talking to, that you are talking to a political pundit. It, if you don't recognize that, if you don't understand the politics behind what you're saying, you should cease talking. You should cease going on political shows and making statements because you're just harming. You're not helping, you're just harming people. If you think your words don't have an impact, see that tweet. Because your words make people like this guy think that people like Castor Semenya are just car wrecks. Think about what your words do because they matter and people are listening to you. I am a biologist, but I'm a little nobody on YouTube. Very few people will see, maybe a couple hundred people will watch this. It's not going to make a big impact. You are someone that millions and millions of people will watch. You are someone that, that politicians will change policy around. From your statement, there will be politicians that go in front of school boards, that go in front of Congress, that go in front of the House of Representatives, and they will make new legislation under your definition. I hope you're prepared to live with that. Thanks everybody for being here. I, I won't be engaging with this kind of rhetoric in the comment section. You say something like this, I will block your ass. If you wanna, if you wanna discuss this, you better do it respectfully. We're talking about human beings. Thanks.